artificial intelligence needs to be built with American democratic values. If it's not, then I think the consequences are uh, going to be uh, quite extraordinary for the Western world. Um, I believe that innovation can happen from anywhere, and I think there are many great lessons uh, from the paper that came out from DeepSeek that we can all learn from in terms of decreasing inference costs. Um, and also, I'm a capitalist, but I think the reason why I wrote that was it was very disappointing for me to see a lot of people in our industry being excited about that moment uh, because it would lead to the demise of companies like Meta, Google, OpenAI, Anthropic, etc. In my mind, I hope, given the deep partnership that we have with OpenAI, that they are the leading company globally in artificial intelligence in a decade. But in my heart, the thing that I care most about is that in any American company, is a leading AI company. Josh, welcome to the Hill and Valley Forum. Thank you for having me. So, um, I figured we could start with maybe you walking us through Thrive's core investment approach and what makes Thrive different. Um, well, first off, it's an honor to be here. Uh, it's been an amazing day, incredible speaker. So, really appreciate you guys having me. Uh, Thrive is an investment firm. Uh, since inception, uh, we have effectively created an opportunistic vehicle that builds and invests uh, in companies, uh, all technology businesses. Uh, we have always been oriented towards being agnostic to stage, sector, and geography, and what that has enabled us to do is, as we've scaled as an organization, we've effectively been doing the same thing uh, since the beginning. Um, over the last 14 years, there's a lot of things that have been very consistent, but I think the two things that have changed the most are, one, uh, we've realized over time uh, that our ambition is really to be the most meaningful partner to those that we work with. And as a result of that, uh, we've been really orienting towards concentrating in both people and ideas. And uh, I think, you know, we've recognized that for us it's more about the journey than it is the destination. So we don't do a lot, but when we do things, uh, we tend to be deeply involved. And then the second thing is you know, we've really kind of developed a deep understanding been being a part of some of the most important category defining businesses that have been built over the last years, that innovation and progress um, really takes a long time. And I think structurally, we have really reoriented the organization towards partnering with companies that we really believe have the capacity to compound over very long arcs. And um, we really believe that uh, the best businesses take a long time to build. So. That's the general orientation of what we do. And Thrive led some pretty big rounds in AI recently, Databricks, Isomorphic, and OpenAI. Do you want to walk us through a little bit Thrive's approach to artificial intelligence and what you see so promising about this new technology? Yeah, as I'm sure um, we'll talk more about and has already been spoken about today, um, this is definitely the most exciting time in my career. I believe that this paradigm shift is one in which I don't think we even begin to uh, appreciate the potential impacts um, of, of what is going to transpire. Um, to date, we've invested in five, I would say, different ways. Uh, the first is we feel very fortunate uh, to be partnered with you know, a, the leading model company in OpenAI. Um, they're the leading consumer business, the leading enterprise business, and I think have been the most innovative uh, with regards to the things that they've uh, built out. Uh, I think the second thing that we've primarily focused on is there's definitely a ton of nuance around uh, domain-specific models, and that is very much oriented towards uh, data needs and the ways in which these models are trained. Uh, the two primary areas that we've focused on are uh, robotics. Uh, we feel very fortunate to be partnered with a company called Physical Intelligence, which is actually creating its own data and a company called uh, Chai and Isomorphic on uh, the bio side. 
Um, uh, we think these are efforts that are very specific and uh, are going to take dedicated teams. Uh, the third area is on the application side. Uh, uh, one example is a company that we're partnered with called Cursor, which is very much focused on coding. I think the application side is both the poten you know, potentially the most exciting, but also one that gives us a great deal of insecurity. Um, I think we're kind of living in this moment in which Apple has launched iOS, but uh, you know, the leading labs have not really figured out what applications they want to own versus what they're willing to let other people build. Uh, the fourth is infrastructures. We've talked about Databricks. Um, you know, as we kind of take a step back, 95% of the world's data exists within nation states or corporations. 5% of the data that exists is on the internet. That's where all the large models have been trained. And I think the capacity to utilize unstructured models and fine tune uh, alongside leading labs is something that we're tremendously excited about. And last is uh, we announced yesterday uh, we're starting a holding company where we're buying traditional businesses and we're applying uh, some of the lessons and insights that we've been able to gather uh, from our association with some of these companies to uh, provide greater efficiency to them. But I also think most importantly, uh, utilize the data that these companies have to help these companies grow more organically as a result of fine tuning models based on the flywheels that they have. And if you zoom out, what do you think is at stake for the country and why it's so important for us to continue leading in AI? And since we're at the Hill and Valley Forum, how do you think that the public sector and the private sector could better partner together to make sure that America continues to lead in artificial intelligence? I think this is the most important moment uh, in our lifetimes. Um, I think in many respects, AI is underhyped. And I think that our capacity to work together and to be unified to recognize that it is so fundamentally important that we win this race uh, is, is just of extreme consequence. Um, I say this uh, with a tremendous amount of humility, uh, and I don't believe that any political party has monopoly on the truth, but sometimes from an outsider's perspective, I feel like uh, the political arena at times can feel more similar to the entertainment industry than anything else. Jacob, if you get the part of the movie, I don't. Whatever side you take, uh, I have to take the opposite side. Um, I think we all understand what we want the outcome to be, which is to have security, to have prosperity, and to advance humanity. And I think as long as we recognize that those are our goals, it is so fundamentally important, it doesn't matter what your politics are, to kind of do whatever is possible in order to ensure that the United States of America uh, really is the leading uh, um, effort and, and country behind, behind this effort. More tactically, you know, for me, it's very simplistic. Um, one, I think the private sector is, is doing its job. Right? Like we have extraordinary people building incredible products that the entire world is using. Uh, there are three things that we need to make sure that we uh, continue to have access to, that is talent. We need to make sure that the best people in the world are here and that they are building alongside of our companies. Uh, the second is compute. Um, I know that you spoke with Jensen this morning, but ensuring that we have the chips that we need in order to continue to train and for inference um, and making sure that we're in control of our own destiny around that topic. And last is energy and power. I think just ensuring that the most, um, uh, the fastest growing companies kind of have access to the power that they need in order to power the compute, I think is fundamentally important. And just making sure that everyone is on the same, same page around those topics uh, hopefully will lead to great outcomes. You, um, you tweeted recently about the open sourcing of DeepSeek, and you said pro-America technologists openly supporting a Chinese model that was trained off of leading US frontier models with chips that likely violate export controls, and according to their own terms of service, take US customer data back to China. So what does that mean to be pro-American AI innovation, and how do we respond to the dangers of something like DeepSeek? It's a very hot topic. <laughs> um, I feel very grateful given that I think that's one of my 50 tweets ever, that everything that I said ended up being true. Um, I think the most 
proficient and efficient artificial intelligence needs to be built with American democratic values. And if it's not, then I think the consequences are uh, going to be uh, quite extraordinary for the Western world. Um, I believe that innovation can happen from anywhere, and I think there are many great lessons uh, from the paper that came out from DeepSeek that we can all learn from in terms of decreasing inference costs. Um, and also, I'm a capitalist, but I think the reason why I wrote that was it was very disappointing for me to see a lot of people in our industry being excited about that moment uh, because it would lead to the demise of companies like Meta, Google, OpenAI, Anthropic, et cetera. Um, in my mind, I hope, given the deep partnership that we have with OpenAI, that they are the leading company globally in artificial intelligence in a decade. But in my heart, the thing that I care most about is that in any American company is a leading AI company. And I think it's really important for all of us, uh, despite the fact that a lot of people here work in finance, to ensure that there are moments where we put our pockets aside for what is most important for this country and for the world. But uh, I probably shouldn't have tweeted, uh, so. <laughs> I, th I thought it was an important part of the conversation, so Thank you. it was good for you to get that out there. Um, the flashiest AI successes in recent years have largely been relegated to screens between LLMs and language models. Do you think that the AI wave will make its way to the robotics and automation sector? And will we see a chat GPT moment in robotics? Yeah, I think uh, robotics is tremendously exciting. Uh, maybe taking a step back, I think this future vision of embodied intelligence uh, can lead to uh, great outcomes, and I think there's uh, second and third order implications associated uh, with, with uh, this that I think we should all pay attention to as well. So a year ago, um, you know, I think historically, like we've been, we've gotten really good at uh, training ro robots to do exactly what we tell them to do. And you know, a year ago, uh, you could train uh, a robot to flip a hamburger, but the second you put pancake mix on the stove, it wouldn't know what to do. And I think we're kind of getting to the point where that is possible. And the types of things that are going to be possible as a result of the fact that these machines will be able to reason is going to be extremely powerful. In many respects, the internet has been this incredible democratizing force. Uh, anyone can have access to information, and we talk a lot about it, this internally at Thrive. I actually think the current manifestation of AI is an incredible democratizing force as well because it enables people to get access to skill. I think uh, as this embodied intelligence world plays out, um, you know, right now we manufacture things in other parts of the world, one, because of labor costs, and two, because we don't know how to make certain things. In a world in which that is possible, that can be very isolationist. And I think there are benefits to countries like America where that's possible, but at the same time, we also have to think about the second and third order implications uh, for countries uh, that don't necessarily have the capacity to bring these things on shore. But it is going to be uh, soon, I think within the next five to 10 years. Um, and, um, I think the impacts are going to be powerful. And are you optimistic about the uh, cost-benefit analysis of job creation? There, uh, one of the earlier panels was basically saying that while robotics might automate certain categories of jobs, you, it would ultimately create entire new categories of jobs, like maintenance, supervision of robots, and the like. 100%. I think, um, you know, the framework that I always have 
when I think about these net new innovations that occur is uh, there will obviously be some level of displacement that happens. But at the same time, if we kind of project out, will our lives be better? And when I think about the amount of access to information, skill, labor that all of us are going to have, uh, I think the capacity to live more prosperous lives is, uh, is going to happen. So uh, I am very optimistic uh, that uh, that will move in a positive direction. So the Speaker of the House is coming a little later. If you had to whisper in his ear, what would be your policy advice to folks in Washington and policymakers for how to best support and facilitate American innovation, especially in cutting edge technologies like AI and advanced robotics? Yeah, I think in many respects, you know, we've, we've talked about this a lot in the past. Um, I think the best entrepreneurs in the world are thinking in first principles and they're always questioning the norm. They're always asking, why has this done be, been done before? And let me think outside the box with regards to how we can do it differently. And I think this moment is different than any other moment. And I think in many respects, uh, the government orienting towards thinking in first principles uh, is going to be fundamentally important. Um, I, I'm very proud of my brother for a lot of the work that he's done, but I remember this incredible moment during COVID when Operation Warp Speed came about. And it was incredible to see the amount of collaboration that occurred uh, between the private sector and the public sector as a result of the fact that there was a crisis. I think right now, as we kind of exist in our current state, it does not feel like a crisis. And the reason why that is the case is because the US is leading across all of these dimensions. But what if we weren't? What were the consequences of another nation state that does not share our democratic values leading in, the, in these efforts be? So my advice, and, and, and I really, I say this with sincerity, I, I, I feel like I should be getting a lot more advice from, from people than I should be giving, would be to treat this moment, even though we're in first place, as an absolute crisis. And if we don't, the consequences could be dramatic. And on first principles, are there first principles that you've seen make founders incredibly successful or correlate with success and execution that you think might be transposable to policymakers? Like for example, uh, your brother's experience with warp speed or? Yeah, I think, you know, in many respects, if you're flying a plane, you don't want to fix every aspect of it. Um, you, 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 you do at the same time want to honor the legacy of the ways in which things have been done and the protocols of the ways in which things have been done, but also at the same time question the norm. And we think a lot about this at Thrive um, because you know, when we started as a firm, uh, there was no such thing as an opportunistic vehicle. Uh, before our first investor ever said yes, we got 50 no's. You were either an early stage firm or a later stage firm. You're either a software firm or a consumer firm. Uh, you're either a US firm or a European firm. And our question was, why? You were not meant to incubate companies. You were not meant to do all the things that uh, we did. But even to this day, we are constantly questioning the norms of what is possible. And that doesn't mean that the solutions that we come up with are always right. We have a ton of humility that uh, uh, you know, some of the things that we come up with are, are, are incorrect. But I think even that framework of just questioning and trying to push as far to the line as possible, but ensuring that you never cross it, is I think that the best founders in the world do. Josh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It. Yeah. Thanks.